You've never had a, a case, have you, where a trustee did not make the perfectly judicious and wise investment decisions? Oh, absolutely that, never. All of all of my clients are perfect. And of course, <laughs> we're, we're being facetious, but you know, you get brother-in-laws, you get, you know, your Uncle Al, and sometimes that's a good decision, but um, there are a lot of cases where it didn't go well. Um, whether it was intentional or unintentional. Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Uh, You'll not be surprised that when we have a show called Life's Third Act that we think, well, what after the curtain goes down, for continuing the metaphor here, (laughs) when the curtain goes down, you know, you're interested in what happens after that. So it does require some planning. But but whenever we come to the subject of estate planning, as we're going to today, and, and we do periodically, not a whole lot on this show, but periodically we do. We view it primarily from the standpoint of the benefit to you, the person who's doing the planning during your lifetime, as opposed to something that's just about once you pass away. So all too often, estate planners spend so much time, you know, emphasizing to you that you've got to take care of of your loved ones when you pass away, which of course you do. But, but I think that there's a far more pressing need, and that's for people who expect to be here, to be living out your third act, the last third of your life you know, for the next 20, 30 years. It's important for you to have planning in place so that you can be taken care of in the best way that preserves your assets, et cetera, in addition to taking care of your loved ones. So um, we're going to talk today about a topic that is relevant toward, you know, managing someone's assets for the benefit of someone else. That's kind of what a trust is. And we won't, we won't assume you know too much. Fortunately, we have a teacher here uh, who, uh, if you've watched this before, you've learned a lot already. Uh, Nina is the uh, managing attorney at Tucker Allen, and uh, and she comes to us periodically. This is all she does is state planning. And so she comes to us periodically and answers some of these questions. And we always have questions, don't we? We have lots of questions. So um, we we want to dedicate today's show, though, to talking about trust and making that that all-important decision about who are the people in your life that you entrust to take care of your needs in the event that you're not able to. So with that kind of as a launching pad, Nina, can can you sort of introduce these topics of trustee and power of attorney? Sometimes that's confused with a trustee. Absolutely. And thank you for having me here today, Mr. Cordell. Thank you for being here. So when people set up their documents, oftentimes they will talk about uh, setting up their financial power of attorney, which is the person who should be entrusted to take care of anything to do with your finances or assets if you are incapacitated. So while the person's still alive. While the person is still alive. Um, The difference is that for a trust, normally you are the uh, and we talked about this before, the trustor or the grantor, uh, as well as the trustee of your trust. You are in charge. As one of my clients says, you're the head honcho, you know, and and you're in charge of the assets that are in the trust, as well as the provisions and existence of the trust. Um, if you become incapacitated, you have designated in your document who will serve after you. And that is always the same succession of people who will serve after you you if you were to pass away. So while the power of attorney is only valid while you're living, the trust or the trustee can be while you're incapacitated to take over for you or will take over for you immediately upon your passing. So kind of setting this stage um, more basically is to say that you want to allow for the possibility that something can happen and we never know when things will happen like a, a stroke, a heart attack, a car accident things that may not take you out of the world immediately. Um, but either way, whether it takes you out of the world immediately uh, or whether you you are in some condition where maybe you're hospitalized, maybe you're at home, but the point is you're not capable mentally of managing your affairs, you want to be able to have in advance selected the person 
that's going to be managing your assets that are in the trust, being paying your bills, your utility bills, your, your mortgage on your house, and distributing money maybe to not only you as a beneficiary, but maybe you've named other people that you want them to take care of along with you maybe because you're taking care of someone maybe now. Uh, but certainly when you're gone, there's other beneficiaries. And that you want to pick somebody carefully to fulfill that role. Can you talk a little bit about more more broadly or maybe more specifically about this role of the trustee, uh, selecting the person maybe? So when we're talking about who you're selecting during your estate planning process to be both your power of attorney and your trustee, we usually try to make it the same person, the same you know, set of people, one, two, hopefully three, maybe you have a third that you can designate. And the reason for that is that that transition from being incapacitated to ultimately when you pass away, it's really difficult to have multiple hands in the pot dealing with different responsibilities. And those responsibilities are very serious. You are giving someone the ultimate control over bank accounts, assets. They can sell or buy things on your behalf. Depending on how your documents are drafted, they could even change beneficiary designations on your uh, life insurance policies or other accounts. And that's sometimes just to avoid probate, but if it's the wrong person, it could be an issue. So, but but the client decides what the rules are, yes. right? To, yes, ultimately, yes. Um, there are some things that are just default responsibilities that would be basically backed up by the statute in the state where the documents are drafted. But these are why we, you know, they're like, wow, there's so many questions you're asking me just to put together a simple document. And they're, they're not simple because they are so specifically tailored to what you're comfortable with. And what you're comfortable with should directly coincide with what is your comfortability level of the person that you have designated to be the trustee after you. And you don't want someone that's going to abuse those powers because we know that does happen. It does. Um, you can have issues where the person is purposefully in a position to, to you know, abuse the power or, or not use the funds properly or to self-deal. But you can also just have somebody who's not very good at being a trustee. You know, the person you may want to handle your health care matters may have really great skills in that area, but not be very good with finances or just isn't very good at calling people back or writing emails, you know, isn't a good communicator. So as much as it's easy to vilify somebody who's in a trustee position who it just isn't doing a very good job, sometimes it's really a matter of they weren't cut out for that job. They to don't begin have with. the skills. So yeah. it's preventable. Right. So somebody who has good organizational skills, that's fair to say, right? Yeah. They don't need to have a college degree in finance, yeah. no, but they have to have good judgment. And, and good intentions are helpful. Yeah, well, honesty. Yeah, they're <laughs> trustworthy. <laughs> yes. Those, uh, honesty is probably important. It's yeah. very a important. Bit. And sometimes a big part of being honest is not having such an ego that you're afraid to ask for help. Normal trust provisions include the capability uh, and in fact, you know, the Missouri statute even speaks to this, that the person, if they are unable to perform or unqualified to perform the specific task, they should reach out and hire a professional. So a trustee is empowered to use trust funds to hire CPAs, to hire attorneys, to hire the, the lawnmower guy to come over and make sure that the grass is good at the house that's still in the trust and hasn't been sold yet. You know, they don't have to do all of these things themselves. And so the ability to understand when you need help is sometimes a really good part of being in a position of responsibility. Yeah. And most people's assets are not, you know, their portfolio is not that complicated. Like, Correct. yeah, I guess some people could have a real complicated portfolio. Right. Like they have real estate to be managed, mm -hmm. you know, or, or I guess the house. It's not uncommon. They, people own a house that has yes. to be kept up. Now, aren't they supposed to provide the heirs accounting records? Like, yes. w And what is that? Are we talking like quarterly, Yeah, annually? but that doesn't happen automatically, does it? It doesn't. It actually, um, so the Missouri statute, and we're going to speak about this in terms of Missouri, but every state can be different. Uh, the Missouri statute provides uh, that you can request, you know, upon request that the trustee shall furnish certain 
records. Um, Usually the trust, though, has specific terms as to whether those happen automatically, those annual accountings, or whether they're going to happen only upon the request of a beneficiary, who they go to, um, those types of things. And also, though, it's not just an annual accounting. You know, there are a lot of things that are informational that the trustee is really has a duty to share the status with the beneficiary. Now, are they supposed to share the actual trust to the beneficiaries? Yes. I mean, the- that's actually in the statute very specifically within 120 days. And, you know, I'm speaking to everyone out there who will ever be a trustee because it is something that is just completely glossed over. And when we get these trusts sometimes a year or two down the road, we're like, hey, did you go ahead and send out that copy of the trust along with your contact information? And people just haven't done that required notice. So within 120 days of the time that someone has passed or within 120 days of the incapacity of someone, when you take over as trustee, you have a duty to send a copy of the trust document along with a notification that you have become the trustee and how to contact Mm -hmm. you to the beneficiaries. And sometimes there's a dispute about whether it should be to contingent beneficiaries too. And as I recall, that's not required unless they ask. Correct. But one thing that people should know, though, is that the Uniform Trust Code, it's this set of, you know, model provisions that are recommended for all states to adopt. Have have most states adopted that in some form or another? In some form or another, yes. So there, there is the, – the good news is whenever we talk about these topics, like, like, like you said, Nina, it may be that our state or Missouri is different, but there's a good chance it's not. Uh, but keep that in mind when you're if you're in another state and something that we suggest is the case here in Missouri. So then you've never had a, a case, have you, where a trustee did not make the perfectly judicious and wise investment decisions? Oh, absolutely that, never. All of all of my clients are perfect. And of course, <laughs> we're, we're being facetious, but you know, you get brother-in-laws, you get, you know, your Uncle Al and Sometimes that's a good decision, but uh, there are a lot of cases where it didn't go well, um, whether mm-hmm. it was intentional or unintentional. Uh, can you talk a little bit about some of the mistakes you've seen in selecting a trustee? So, um, you know, I, when I'm talking to people about making a designation, I start to describe this ideal trustee, this person who's really good at calling people back, that really is, you know, accessible, doesn't have too much on their plate, isn't too busy, has lots of money, so they don't need the money in the trust. And they're like, well, gosh, there's nobody like that in my family. You know, should I just designate a bank? And I'm like, no, not necessarily. You know, who do you have? And they'll start describing the person. And it's very interesting because I think people are idealistic about their children because their children haven't had an opportunity to mess up yet. So a lot of times they'll they'll you know refuse to appoint anybody who's had a, an opportunity to mess up in life already, but they're like, darn it, my 19 year old is just so responsible. She is earnest and wonderful and she's gonna do such a great job. And I thought, well if something happens tomorrow, your 19 year old is really gonna be is running everything. Yeah. Is in college and is not gonna have time for this. So that ideal trustee is generally somebody who is okay with asking for help. If you have somebody who fancies themselves a lawyer or a CPA, but is not actually a lawyer or a CPA, they can be the most insufferable trustees. And again, these are none of my clients I've ever oh, had. Of course. None. Yeah, they were none. Things um, we've be- read you know about. why? Because the clients that we have are ones who are not afraid to ask for help from a firm because the firm does not actually act as a trustee. The firm is just merely representing the trustee in their in their duties as a trust administrator. Right. But, but in fairness, it it's it's not our clients. It's them of their choices that that are often problems. And, yes. And it, so it, you know, it's not the client's fault that they're having to make a decision about something that requires you know, prophetic powers, you yes. know, you're looking into the future and you're trying to say what what lies ahead, and especially with children, as you said, because often they'll be doing this planning when children are, you know, maybe th- under 30. 
and not understanding, you know, what they're going to maybe grow up to be or what some of the challenges that they're going to have. And, you know, the good news is we try to get, uh, we, we offer a meeting with people immediately after one of our clients passes away to really give um, a little bit of a training exercise to that trustee right. and say, here's what your duties are. And they're not required to hire us. They can hire anyone or hire no one, but we give them a checklist of all the things that they're going to need to do as a trustee. And if they need help, they can come back to us and say, gosh, I looked at this and I don't want to do it. Would you guys handle this which is, for me? Which yeah. is the right decision for a lot of <laughs> now, people. Now, the trustees, are they compensated for doing this? Out of yes. the estate. They, they can, should be. They, they can they, be. Yeah. Um, there are provisions that uh, normally the person who creates the trust will do a provision that says neither I nor the person serving with me will receive any compensation. And sometimes they add on to that saying, oh, yeah, and also my kid and my kid and my kid, if they're serving as trustee, they're also not being compensated because they're also a beneficiary. Okay. But um, – you know, we have uh, a case that there was a, a child and they're uh, taking care of the administration of the trust and they're dealing with all of these other siblings. And the amount of time that they're putting into it, whether it's just driving over and, you know, getting the mail and making sure everything's good with the property until it can be liquidated and, and dealing with all this paperwork back and forth at the bank, meeting with me, um, you know, all of those things that happen – and if they were actually in line to just get the same percentage as the rest of the other children, that might be more of a peacemaker thing. And sometimes people defer and don't want to take a fee, but they are entitled to take a fee. And that's usually, again, on this reasonableness standard. I hope nobody's checking how many times I say reasonable or prudent today. If you've been down in law school, the answer is reasonable. Reasonable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, a reasonable fee is around a uh, three quarters of a percent for somebody who's just an individual, not a bank or a trust company. And that's of the total holdings of the trust. Of the trust. Okay. So when you're getting ready to make that final distribution, you can do an accounting and then you can include that fee. Um, And the good thing to do to kind of prove that it is reasonable, is to keep track of your time. Because if you ever have Mm -hmm. to have a meeting with people, they would never understand, if you speak about it generally, the amount of time it takes to do this job properly. Um, So everyone's listening right now is going to say, wow, I'm really glad you're telling me this. I never want to serve as a trustee. Yeah. (laughs) And, And, you know, it is, it comes back to uh, the particular facts in each case, and a lot of our clients are um, are probably middle to upper middle. Uh, we have some, of course, we have some wealthy clients. Uh, Tucker Allen has some wealthy clients, but but our our core demographic really is middle and upper middle class. So so these are people who of who don't have you know twenty million dollars to invest, and and for those people. Uh, that that can require more time if it's spread out over a bunch of investments. You probably do have professionals you're using a lot of. Yes. But really, in a strange way, it can actually require more time and more headaches when you're not at the level where you can hire a lot of professionals and instead, you know, it is, say, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000 and it's spread over various assets and you have six beneficiaries who live in six different states, and you know you can you could just because it's not maybe twenty million dollars, for example. Some people think, oh, it's easier. Well, oddly enough, the twenty million dollar estate may be easier than the amount of time that's required in a particular case. It for a person who is not wealthy, who has we'll call mid-range wealth. It's formulaic when the numbers are so high. You know, you know that you're dealing with potential estate tax issues and you kind of just put things through the funnel and you're not afraid of spending the money to really get it done well because the stakes are so high. But when yeah. you are you have this fiduciary duty to the beneficiaries, you're responsible to do things for their benefit. One of those things is to make sure you don't spend all the money on things that it doesn't need to be spent on and that you can get it out to the beneficiaries who are probably, if it's middle class estate, thinking, hey, I'd really like to get this. This is going to help. Right. Um, So Mm -hmm. it's balancing all of those things. But what is a reasonable amount of time to distribute the funds from the estate? I mean, what's considered reasonable? Are we talking two years after a person's 
if it, if it goes above, I mean, you should be getting information along the way. So after that initial mailing of the trust document with the information for the trustee, you shouldn't have like a year where you don't hear anything. Um, but you may receive updates that say, hey, we're still gathering up assets. We're getting them retitled into the name of the trust. We're splitting up retirement accounts and getting them into the beneficiaries names, but we haven't funded those accounts yet. Um, If you have a trust that creates lifetime trusts for the beneficiaries, which is a great tool, Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about this before, to help with creditor and divorce protection, that needs a little bit of time also. So if you're seeing no progress within a a six to 12 month period, because if you file a notice to creditors, you got to make sure that the trust doesn't owe anybody anything. So you have at least a six month period for that. Um, But if you're not seeing any movement between that six and 12 month period, you should be seeing a lot of wrapping up between 12 and 18 months. And again, you, you know, you might have a very simple trust, you might have very simple assets, and it might be able to be done before then. Um, Sometimes trust will make distributions to beneficiaries before the notice to creditor period is up. We don't necessarily advise about that, but if that person was already handling their mother's, you know, estate and, and all of her finances as a power of attorney and they know she didn't know anybody any money and their They got a pretty good bills, picture, right. They'll come in and they'll say, she doesn't know anybody anything. It can be less risky to get money out of the trust, but you have to explain to the beneficiaries, hey, if somebody comes along and has a claim against the trust, we're going to have to claw back that money. Yeah, and whenever you say the notice to creditors period, why don't you explain just real briefly what you mean. Sure. So if you if you file a notice, which is a publication in Missouri, it has to run for a certain amount of weeks, and that's either for a probate or for a trust. It can shorten the year period that people have to make claims to six months. So that's the other thing about trusts is when they come to us when they're already frustrated and Mm -hmm. an administrator is like, oh my goodness, this is already a mess and I just need your help cleaning up the last little bit up. It's only 5% left and we go back to the beginning and say, did you file a notice to creditors? Did you um, distribute, you know, did you give everybody a copy of the trust in 120 days? You know, they haven't done these things. So that's a very easy thing to do at the beginning to shorten the amount of time so that you don't have to worry about writing checks and then calling people up and saying, hey, I know I gave you this money, but I'm going to need about $10,000 back. (laughs) That wouldn't be a good phone call to make. No, it's not. (laughs) And so let's clarify, too, um, this role of trustee and power of attorney. And I'll say a few things, then throw it to you to more fully explain. But I know a lot of people confuse that, gee, if I had a power of attorney, why do I need to have a trust or a trustee. And um, it's true that with a power of attorney, while somebody is alive, if we're talking about just the risk that you become incapacitated, then you could technically say, well, yeah, a power of attorney would allow somebody to sign checks for you, to sign your name on almost everything um, if if you had a, power, a full power of attorney. So there is something really attractive about that in terms of meeting your needs while you're alive. But it also, if you imagine taking away all these protections that we just talked about, you know, that this these sort of rules that are when you create a trust, you get to create a bunch of rules that you want you you control how your money's managed. You get to even put in rules about how it's distributed apart from you. You uh, you just have a whole lot of control, and you have this whole uniform trust code that spells out obligations and duties. So it's a much more solemn role whenever you you create a trust and then you let a trustee do those things for you. But I just want you to be familiar with these two terms and and not to confuse them and to understand that a power of attorney has a function, but it's not to replace the trustee. What are your thoughts on that? So there's actually something specific. Um, they've dealt with a case uh, within the last year that the power of attorney was actually acting in a way that was not in, uh, not consistent with the, the holder estate of the plan. power. Correct. It wasn't what they had actually put in uh, in writing about what their estate plan was going to be, and so they were taking assets and diverting them away from 
what the goal of the trust was going to be while the person was still alive. And um, there's nothing really to stop that. I mean, hopefully there was a remedy, but, there but is. the whole idea is the person has, you know, you may say, I want the million dollars in my savings account to go to my sister Sue. And this could be without a trust. It makes it maybe more graphic for you if you imagine a will. So you have this great plan that you expect to be in place, and someone moves that from that account. The, you know, what can you do when you die? You know, there's a will, and you wanted something to go to a certain place, and it's not there anymore. This is why we talk about gifting provisions and powers of attorney, because if you have unlimited gifting powers, you can write checks out of that person's account to different family members or yourself sometimes. And it can get out of hand, I and can imagine. It, and it, in some cases, is legal. It, you know, it's not... It's something that has to do with who you picked and what powers you gave them. So then when you're advising clients, you advise them to have both? And would you explain that? Yes. I I definitely uh, advise clients to have power of attorney. If you don't have all your your assets in a trust— which normally you would not. Your trust is the beneficiary of a lot of your assets, but it doesn't trigger That's it going into there conversation. until after you pass away. <laughs> so the stuff that you have right now, the stuff you have today, is what is controlled by your power of attorney. So if you're incapacitated, uh, you are unable or unwilling, you're like, I do not want to handle my finances anymore. I wasn't good at it to begin with, and now I'm even worse. I want this person to handle things. They will work with what you currently have, uh, your your life insurance, your retirement plans, your, um, you know, making sure you take your required minimum distributions, anything to do with your checking account, down to the most minute detail. Um, and if you need to sell your home and, and move into a assisted living or something like that, they're able to sign those documents for you. Uh, But your trustee would not necessarily be able to do that. And the trustee is able to look at what the terms are and to uh, deal with things that are specifically governed by the trust. But most of their responsibilities don't kick in until after you've passed away. Unless you have, uh, yeah, I see your point. Um, Your point is that Sometimes the assets that that are most important while you're alive, you may not have placed inside the trust. So remember that the trustee only gets to rule the trust, the things that you've already put in it. Some things, for tax reasons, for example, you decide that you don't want to put in now, but the moment you die, it goes into the trust. So everything ends up in the trust. But But if you have a stroke this evening, uh, it might be that the assets that – you would want to access, that you'd want somebody to access for you would not be the ones that are in the trust. And in that case, the person with the power of attorney would be able to do that. That's a little confusing that we don't put all the assets in immediately. It it is, uh, but it's very much gives you a lot of, you know, a lot of control. We have uh, people who have placed their houses into a trust, into a revocable trust, and then when they go to sell it, they get a check that's in the name of the trust. Well, they never needed a bank account that was in the name of the trust before. Mm. So there are just little administrivia things that can be annoying and are really not necessary, Um, but Nonetheless, with the power of attorney, that is what a bank is going to take. That is what, you know, any, it's similar to health care, you know, bringing it to a hospital. That document is paramount for while you are living for somebody to act on your behalf. Right. If it's a trust, they're going to be like, great, tell us what's in the trust and, and print out the specific pages that say what you can do under this trust. Power of attorney is a standard document, widely accepted, and that is what is going to get the job done if you are acting for somebody else while they are unable to act for themselves. Yeah, now, in the short term. What I want to know, what if the trustee isn't, or maybe it's perceived, they're not acting in an honest manner, and, and they're not distributing the funds, and it's going on for years. Mm-hmm. How is this enforced? Who polices the trustee to do what they're supposed to. I mean, are we talking they that the the heirs have to go seek legal counsel? So there's it, there's an informal way of doing this, which is you know you could still see an attorney, but not file something in court yet. And there's a more formal process that's governed by the Missouri statute. So sometimes, and this goes with almost any type of misbehavior, sometimes getting a very um, 
firm, direct attorney to draft something or to make a phone call on your behalf can let somebody know that there is oversight, that you know, maybe these people that are beneficiaries don't have the legal acumen to know exactly why something's off, but they know they're not getting the service that they're entitled to. And so they go seek legal counsel. And they can do that um, collectively, provided they don't have a conflict of interest between them on who's getting what. You mean the heirs. Yes, if they're all similarly, if they're all similarly situated, that's another legal term. If they're all people who have the same interests and they don't, they have a similar complaint too. You know, they're, the guy's not calling us back and we don't know what's going on with our money. They don't all need to go get their own attorneys. They can go see one person. That person can either make a phone call and and usually put something in writing as well, a letter or an email saying, look, I'm representing these beneficiaries and I need this information from you and we'll start there. Uh, But I've also been informed that you haven't done X, Y, and Z. And according to the terms of the trust and according to the Missouri statute, you have a duty to do these things. And here's your deadline to get them done. The Missouri statute allows for a 90-day kind of curing period for people to get their stuff together as a trustee. And so if you have somebody who really isn't hiding anything, but they're just lazy or overwhelmed and really shouldn't have taken on this job to begin with, they have a couple of options at that point. They can voluntarily withdraw as being trustee and let the and, next and person be appointed. And that's not uncommon. I mean, no. it becomes a headache and and one sibling says to the other three, well, look, you tried doing this. I'm not doing it anymore. Right. And then, then suddenly there has to be a formal process and whoever's been named, what, as the successor? As the successor trustee would then take over, usually to a nice little mess. We get those calls too for trust administration, like, oh man, I just took over as trustee. Can you help me sort out this plate of spaghetti? Because the, oh, I'm I'm getting to it, it's going on, is similar to like the checks in the mail um, and maybe nothing has been done during that period of time or equivocally nothing. And so you have to start right from the beginning and get back on track and get things done. And sometimes Mm -hmm. it's not that difficult and other times people have made a mess of things. So if they get a letter from another lawyer saying, hey, somebody's watching you and you need to get this done properly, if they're simply just bad at their job, a lot of times they'll be like, get me out of here. I don't even really want to be doing this. Okay, I'm going to take it one step further. So say this trustee, there's mischief going on, Mm -hmm. taking from the estate that doesn't belong to them. Self-dealing. Self-dealing. Okay, I like that. I like that. Can criminal charges be filed for something like that? Technically, yes. It is very unusual. Right. And the reason it's unusual is that the remedy for a criminal charge, other than if it was prosecuted to the point where there would be prison time, would be restitution, which is fancy word for paying people paying back. back. Um, and this person inevitably doesn't have the money to pay well, back. You, I knew you were going to bring up judgment-proof people, but yes. And so that's the same remedy as a civil case. So a criminal case is usually not filed absent a civil case. The evidence presented in a civil case is oftentimes very useful, if not the basis for the criminal charge. So if people are satisfied by the civil case, meaning that the person was able to get them you know, right. paid back, they'll usually just drop it and say, okay, well, that's fine. you know. But if the person is unable to pay them back and ends up with this civil judgment against them that's not worth the paper it's printed on because now you have to... F- try to do a garnishment on their wages or, you know, all of these other things that make it very difficult to get that money back, then you may, uh, they may opt for a criminal charge at that point. But like I said, it's very unusual. I'm sure. Well, and, and let me add this too, as we wrap up is one of the virtues of a trust is that it's intended to work without a lot of lawyers, certainly without a lot of judges, meaning courts. I mean, it's beauty is that Despite these stories we've been talking about, the things where the train goes off the track, in the overwhelming number of cases, it operates without any judge being involved at all, meaning that the moment that you have a stroke or the moment that you pass away, you know, there's somebody named to be the successor, the next trustee, if you were the one who was the trustee. And it just happens that way without any court intervention, unless some of these things we've talked about go wrong. 
So its beauty is that while you spend a little more for a trust, I mean, there's no question that in the vast majority of cases, you save far more money than if your plan B was to do a will. We won't get into that argument today, but we've talked about it in the past. Any comments as we wrap up? Well, to end on a more positive note, because of all our disaster preparedness that we Uh usually go through, is just be communicative. Sometimes you can basically plead your case as a beneficiary to the trustee and say, hey, come on, you know, this needs to be handled right now. If you can't give me an answer this week, you need to spend some time on this and do it next week or offer them a way out if you need somebody else to take over. But don't immediately jump to the conclusion that something nefarious is happening because in the vast majority of cases, it's just a question of did they get you know, paperwork fatigue or they waiting to hear back from an investment company, you know, what is really the holdup? And I think sometimes the email is so popular, people love to have things in writing, but start with a phone call, have a real conversation with somebody, and then follow it up with an email summarizing it. So you do have it in writing that you made the inquiry, but this is still somebody who was probably a family member. Um, Mm -hmm. It was very close to the person who passed away, and it is not an easy time after someone passes. So just because that person has a job, just remember they're still human, and there's usually a way out of it that doesn't require attorney representation. See, now, if everybody took that advice, we wouldn't have a lot to do in terms yeah. of <laughs> the state litigation. Not a good sales job on yeah. my part. Yeah. But, or call but, if you still need help. Yes, yes. Uh, so, so Nina Windsor, a great guest. We appreciate your coming on board. And we, uh, I'm sure that we'll have other occasions to pick up the cudgel of this conversation. Thanks again for having me. All right. This has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit tuckerallen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements. 